So not only did Louisville, uh, not only did the Germans build Louisville, Cincinnati, most of your thriving and successful cities in the Midwest, uh, but Germans have been integral in our education system. So if you went to kindergarten, you should think of German. If you went to high school or a common school, free public education school, a taxpayer expense, you went to a university, trade school, vocational school, who studied a seminar, who used psychology in the classroom, if you went to an academy, you did any of those things, went to any of those buildings, studied in any of those methods, thank a German. Say, hey, Germans, thank you. Thank you for the education. I appreciate it. You all give us these, all this education. Says, thanks for kindergarten. That's that give us a good start. Kindergarten, kindergarten's a German word. Kindergarten, did you go to kindergarten? You're welcome. The Germans brought that. Kindergarten. So, education. German thought and practice have exerted a great deal of influence on American education. These influences were transmitted not only by German Americans, but also by non-German Americans who had studied in Germany, had traveled there, who had maintained correspondence with leading German educators and intellectuals. The entire education system from kindergarten to university was deeply influenced and patterned after German educational models. These influences began early in American history. Cotton Mather, the famous New England divine, corresponded in Latin with August Hermann Franke, the noted philanthropist who established the first model orphanage in Hall, Germany. This is an example of the Anglo-German intellectual exchange that took place between leading thinkers in both countries and contributed to the flow of ideas to the New World from Germany and Pennsylvania. Germans maintained their own schools that used German as a language of instruction. Their most distinguished te teacher was Franz Daniel Pastorus, founder of Germantown. He served as Burgoo master and leading educator. The school established in 1702 even had an evening program for those who worked during the day. Another German-American who distinguished himself in the classroom was Christopher Dock. At midnight, he introduced a blackboard into the American classroom, which became a basic instrument of instruction. So blackboards. You have a board in front of your classroom where the teacher writes on. Germans brought that to America. You write on a blackboard because of a German, Christopher Dock. At midnight. In 1750, he published the first pedagogic work in America. In 1764, he published his well-known 100 Necessary Rules of Conduct for Children, which provided some basic rules and guidelines for how children should behave. Interest in German educational methods were greatly enhanced by a French brochure titled Report on the State of Public Education in Prussia. So Prussia, which is uh, what eventually becomes Germany, so uh, now I'm part Prussian. Yeah, so... Prussian. Um, I was published in 1832 by the well-known philosopher Victor Cousin. Victor Cousin, the Prussian system, he says. Well, no, no, no. The Prussian system, just those phrases, the word, the Prussian system became uh, to be a, a phrase describing a plan of education based upon freedom of access to schools operated at public expense with state supervision with the three gradations of scholastic teaching, the common school, the high school, or academy, and the university. So the Prussian system. Public schools paid for at public expense, freedom of access to those schools with state supervision, with also you had the middle or the, the elementary, the common school, the high school, and the university. That's the Prussian system. The Prussian system was the common school, the high school, and the university. When the Michigan Constitution of 1835 was in the progress, was in the process of being written, the Prussian system was incorporated into that fundamental law due to the work of individuals familiar with Cousin's report. All the elements of the Prussian system were put in place in Michigan, primary schools, secondary schools, and a university, all supported by public taxation and under state supervision. Due to Victor Cousin's report, the School Board of Ohio was induced to send the Reverend Calvin E. Stowe, the husband of Harriet Beecher Stowe, a board to make a closer study of German education. His enthusiastic report published in 1836 gave a detailed account of what he had observed. Another American educator who gave high praise to German schools was Horace Mann of Massachusetts. Horace Mann, first person to put, have a first American common school. Horace Mann's unbounded admiration of the preparation of teachers inspired him to organize the first American normal school in 1839. In his book on Mann, Burke Hinsdale noted, it is Germany that in this century has exerted upon our country the most protracted, the deepest, and most salutary educational influence. Mann's famous seventh annual report, 1843, praised the Prussian schools. Mann was especially impressed with the teacher training 
their kindness, and the absence of corporal punishment. So the reason why there is no corporal punishment now today in schools because of Germany. If a nun didn't smack your hand or if you weren't getting spanked in school, thank Germans for stopping corporal punishment. One of the most profound educational influences came through the works and writings of Johann Frederick Herbart, a professor of Göttingen. He introduced psychology into teaching and enthusiastic American educators founded the first Herbarschen Club in 1892. Efforts to use the German university as a model were particularly pronounced in Michigan. Several of the early university presidents were tireless in their endeavors to follow the German model. A university in the East that reflected the German model was Cornell, founded in 1868. Cornell thanked the Germans for existing. Its first president, Andrew D. D. White, who had served as U.S. minister to Germany from 1879 to 1881, and was impressed with what he saw was guided by the German university model as he helped establish Cornell University. White was especially interested in building up technical education and is no doubt due to this influence that the first school of forestry in the United States was established at Cornell. German influences were also strong at John Hopkins University, which was founded in 1876. Almost all the faculty members had obtained their doctoral degrees in Germany. The idea of establishing university libraries with separate departmental libraries was patterned under German universities, as was the concept of a seminar which students and professors gathered, gathered in small groups. So Miss McConnell uh, group in UofL, forget the guy's name, but he wanted to do a seminar where we're supposed to be in small groups with professors and students. Wasn't no seminar, but the idea of a seminar, German people, the Germans brought that. Cornell, John Hopkins University, these are uh, influenced by Germans, Cornell and John Hopkins University. So, um, so most areas of German American settled German instruction could be found. All the private and parochial schools offered German instruction in the colonial era. It was not until 1840 in Cincinnati that the first German bilingual public school programs were established. So Cincinnati was the first bilingual program. I learned Spanish, so bilingual education has been a typical part of the American education system. Uh, thereafter, similar public schools spread throughout. Uh, similar public school programs spread throughout the country. They're based on the model in Ohio, so other bilingual programs are spreading throughout America where the legislature had directed all boards of education to introduce German instruction whenever it was requested by at least 75 citizens. German Americans since created and established bilingual education in America, something that is quite common today. German was taught in elementary schools across the country well into the 20th century. Until 1918, there was a German department in the Cincinnati Public Schools under the direction of Dr. H.H. H. Fick who published a series of textbooks that were used in German bilingual programs across the country. Before the First World War, the program consisted of 250 German teachers, and there were more than 15,000 German students. A typical book used in the program was Fix New Undalt in Buck Fer Die Jujin, 1911. During the latter part of the 19th century, a new German educational influence was introduced, which had marked effect on the American school system. Vocational education, Germany had a great success with its trade schools, they're eagerly imitated by other European nations. So common schools, universities, high schools, vocation, trade schools, kindergartens, psychology. They're eagerly imitated by other European nations. Americans too become interested in German practices were soon introduced here. Today, vocational education is commonplace. In Germany, a dual track system of education was developed, which provides equal opportunities for students to enter the vocational education track or the track leading to university education, this kind of dual track system with equal possibilities for vocation. Vocational and academic education has not been developed in the United States. Unfortunately, indeed, vocational education is highly underrated and underdeveloped. However, there are some exceptions to in some areas, especially where German Americans settled. Here, vocational high schools were developed so that students could prepare themselves for various trades, crafts, and occupations. Also, German Americans introduced what became known as a cooperative form of education, which would allow for students to gain on-the-job training while enrolled in high school. This concept was also introduced at the University of Cincinnati in the early 1900s by Hermann Schneider, where co-op education thrives today. In the early 1900s, Schneider began to ponder the question of how theoretical knowledge in the classroom could be combined with firsthand experience on the job. As a professor of engineering, he felt that engineers could be trained concurrently in theory and practice. So practical applica application is a German thing. Uh, having uh, students begin part-time employment during the college years and having this work recognized as part of their educational program. He proposed that a school be established and have students co-op with industrial plants. 
These plans were developed while Schneider was at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania in 1903. He came to the University of Cincinnati as an assistant professor of civil engineering. In 1904, he presented a paper entitled A Communication on Technical Education, which displayed his thoughts on the need to integrate practical work experience into education. He gained the opportunity of trying his plan for one year, and the plan was introduced in 1906. It became a great success at the University of Cincinnati, and it's still utilized today. Psychology. Psychology. I took educational psychology. So, you're welcome. <laughs> I'll take the credit for the Germans. The German in Louisville. So, uh, yeah, using uh, theoretical and practical application knowledge is exactly what we need to do. University of Cincinnati is still doing that, not only in the College of Engineer, but also in the Colleges of Business, Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. An excellent survey of German educational influences before World War I can be found in Henry... Geitz's et al. German influences on education in the United States to 1917. For references to sources of information dealing with influences since that time, see the bibliographies listed at the end of this volume. From the top to the bottom of the scale, German educational influences can be found and have come to be widely accepted as American. This is perhaps but one more indication of how deep and widespread German influences are, that they are accepted as American and as part of the way things are in America. Yet, here, as in other areas, when the origins are examined, they are found to be in German. Germans brought us scientists, engineers, architects, bridges, coal mines, um, uh, you know, Bach, Wagner, Brahms, Beethoven, LCD screens, lots of beer, our education system. Our entire education system is because of German Americans. Kindergarten. Kindergarten movement here in Louisville was a protracted struggle. It was hard to get kindergarten into America. Specifically here in Louisville. Louisville played an important role in the kindergarten movement in the United States based upon the teachings of the German educator Frederick Froebel. The earliest kindergartens in this country were founded in German communities. Louisville had one of the first ten established by William Hailman in 1865 at the German English Academy at 2nd and Gray Streets. It did not last when he left Louisville to become a school administrator. Translator of Froebel's work in English and later the first chairman of the kindergarten section of the National Education Association. Frederick Froebel sustained kindergarten work began in Louisville in 1887 under the auspices of prominent Louisville women who were working with poor and immigrant children at the Holcomb Mission on West Jefferson Street. These women were Miss Louise Yandel, Albana Carter, J.R. Clark, W.N. Little, A.C. Bowser, Albert S. Willis, Mary L. Graham. The mission was run by converted gambler Steve Holcomb to Christianize and Americanize the immigrant population. At the mission's industrial school, which trained children in trades, the women began a kindergarten class in February 1887 for children too young to sew. 1887, Sanfordtown introduced the first schools in Kenton County. Kenton County, you need to thank your Germans. If you went to school in Kenton County, it's because of the German people. If you uh, have a fire department in Kenton County, Germans were the first ones to establish fire departments in Kenton County. Sanford Town. Check it out. So here in Louisville, in 1887, they started the first kindergarten program, February 1887. Uh, Miss J.R. Clark gave up the money for her new fur coat to buy the first teacher salary. The Louisville matrons, after studying the kindergarten in other cities, decided to start a training school for kindergarten teachers in the fall of 1887, enrolling five students and using the Mission Kindergarten as their uh, laboratory, the laboratory school. A Louisville native, Anna Bryan, trained at the Armour Institute in Chicago and was hired as the superintendent. She was invited to live at the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Carter of Carter Dry Goods. In October 1887, the Louisville Free Kindergarten Associate was incorporated at a meeting at the Warren Memorial Presbyterian Church at 4th Street and Broadway. Kindergartens established by the association flourished. A second was started in February 1887 at the Home of the Innocents. When the first class graduated from the training school in February 1889, two more kindergartens were begun. They were directed by graduates Patty Smith Hill and Finney Burton. Burton at the Sunbeam Kindergarten, 22nd and Walnut Streets, and Hill at the German Free Kindergarten at Clay and Market. By September 1889, four more were established, including one for black children. Training classes for black teachers were organized as well. By 1890, three more kindergartens were begun. The Louisville kindergartens began to get national attention, attracting over 3,000 visitors in one year to see the experimental work. Included among visitors were prominent educators John Dewey, 
Colonel Francis Parker and William Hellman, along with others who had heard Anna Bryan and Patty Smith Hill speak at national meetings about their kindergarten work. So as a protracted struggle, it was hard to get kindergarten here in Louisville. So if you went to kindergarten in Louisville, you'd be in the common schools or vocational schools or universities or high schools. Uh, if you're in a trade school or an academy or have been in a seminar, you should, uh, you should thank your Germans. Thank you, German people, for bringing us education. Thanks, Germans, for bringing America, uh, bringing education to America. Occupy.